more or less about. HTML5. Uh, so everybody's going to have different things here uh, that they've used or haven't used. Um, and, if you're, and if this is all really new to you, please feel free. I'm going to stop and ask if people have questions. And I'm assuming everyone will have at least one question for me because uh, I don't know everything and I'm sure I'll miss things. So there's just a couple key concepts we're going to talk through. Uh, and these are sort of very important. <laughs> these are very important, sorry. Uh, for building a modern JavaScript application. Um, JavaScript modules. Uh, yeah, we'll have, I'll, I'll get there. We'll get there. JavaScript modules, build processes, dependency management, mock APIs, and templatized views. Um, does everybody know what a module is? JavaScript module or, or module pattern, programming module pattern? Does any who doesn't know what this is? Somebody must not know what this is. Yes. Okay. So what I mean is, it's something that shelters the scope. Of the, of the code you're writing so that it doesn't influence other things. Um, and something where you can declare at the top the dependencies that that thing has so that its dependencies are fulfilled within itself. So generally with the module, with a, like a truly, you know, traditional, awesome module, every single thing you need is in that file. If you look at the file, you can see that all of my dependencies are declared at the top um, and there's no, there's no mysteries about where this variable is being declared or defined. JavaScript is very much not like that in many cases. When you look at a traditional web application, you've got a whole bunch of script tags, and you've got a few things in the page maybe. Um, you don't know where those variables were declared. You don't know where those functions came from. You hope I put the jQuery script tag in so that dollar is defined. But, you, but that's really, you don't have a single place to look. So modules solve that problem. Uh, build process is important because when you use a module pattern, and you define all your dependencies at the top, and you want to pull all those things together, you have to have some kind of a bundler or a build system to be able to evaluate all that stuff and put it together. And it's kind of, it's not really a compiler, but people call them compilers. So just pretend that it's a compiler, and just, we can call it a transpiler, and call it something like that. But fundamentally what it's doing is it's parsing your individual files and putting them together. So that's how your dependency management is resolved. Um, on a completely different thing, mock API. If you have built a data-driven thing or have tried to, and you're building the front end, you've been out of sync with the back end. It happens every time. Somebody on the back end isn't done yet. Maybe they change it. Maybe they don't know what they want to do. Um, so it's really important to have some way that you can easily build a mock API for yourself that will be close to the way the production API is going to be in, in, in many ways. You want to be able to do things like set headers and change the output and maybe access a database and whatever you, you know, maybe not, but, and maybe you're just going to mock it. But, you're, but it's still it's important to be able to produce data for yourself and to have something where it's not going to require you to rewrite the code when you get rid of the mock layer. And this last thing is templatized views. Um, this leads into the next session, um, and we'll probably talk about this stuff a little more in the next one. Um, any kind of a modern application is going to use an MVC pattern, and you're going to have a, a view that has a template that gets data, and that template gets repeated, and you output stuff. This is a very common pattern. It's JSPs and ASP, and everything does this. But JavaScript is very has had a lot of bad habits for the last couple of years, and hasn't. I mean, before the last couple of years. In the last couple of years, it's become a sort of obvious common thing, and of course we use mustache templates or EJS templates or some other kind of template to produce the markup on the screen when you have data that's creating that markup. So, um, I'll talk more about models in a second. Um, so what I'm going to show you is tooling based on these packages. There are many options for this stuff, and there's not always a right answer. I work for the code, we make CanJS. I think CanJS is great. CanJS has a really small API. It solves a lot of presentational problems. Um, but CanJS uses jQuery. Um, I like to use Lodash. Lodash is a utility library. So if you are trying to take all the keys out of an object, for instance, Lodash gives you a really nice, pretty way to say, keys, give me the keys. Or if I want to pluck all of the values at a particular key, I can say pluck and give me all the values and it will give me an array. 
So, but th th like I said, this is opinionated in the sense of there are there's underscore that does the exact same thing. I just I just like Lodash better. <laughs> um, NVD3 is a charting library built on top of D3. There's a panel about D3 tomorrow that you should all go to. I have no idea who's presenting it, but it'll be worth going to if you haven't used D3. And even if you have, it probably will still be worth going to. What's D3? D3 is a visualization library for JavaScript. D3 has a jQuery-esque pipe pattern, but it, but it uh, allows you to create SVGs and do things like animate them and change their data in a way that is a little less painful than it would be otherwise. SVG it's is not SVG. Painful. Pardon me? It's not SVG. It, it, it creates SVG. D3 does. It can. It can create HTML as well. But it generally, most of the reason people use it is for, D, is for SVG. It does create SVG DOM. Um, jQuery, everybody, is there anyone that hasn't heard of jQuery? Okay, I'm not even going to talk about jQuery. The only, well, I'm going to say one thing about it. What I'm going to use out of jQuery that's really obviously jQuery is a, uh, maybe isn't obviously jQuery, is a promise pattern. So in asynchronous programming, you need to use something called a promise pattern to make any sense of this asynchronicity that happens all the time. There are others. So a promise is something that you should, I probably shouldn't explain it verbally, you should probably look it up. Um, but it puts forth the idea that I'm going to define that when something happens, I will have a promise, and the promise says I can define callbacks to call when it fails or when it succeeds. And then it allows you to do things like put all those things together and then run everything. Like I've resolved seven AJAX requests. I can call when and when they're all done, give all the data back to something. Um, when you say resolve the, the AJAX requests. Yeah. You mean you've received the response? I've received the response back. So an XHR, X, XML HTTP request, is what an AJAX is, right? So when that thing indicates that it's finished, you get something back. and that's. You know, 99% of the time it's an asynchronous operation. So the browser fires off however many you've requested. When they come back, you get them, the thread picks it up, and it runs the code you've assigned to the callback function. Um, the promise pattern just gives you a little nicer way of doing that other than saying jQuery and having a success handler stuck into my AJAX call. It lets you use the same way of dealing with an AJAX call that you would, I mean, it lets you use that same pattern for other kinds of asynchronous operations and your code look the same. It's very important. And all jQuery's AJAX methods now also have a promise API uh, as of the last year. So they all have, you can, you can just say get done. And it's it actually, as you use it, it actually makes a lot more sense. Because it sort of chains and flows together. Uh, other things up here. Um, Webpack. Webpack is a module bundler. So this is this compiler thing. Um, compiling transpiling, whatever, it takes all your little modules and it puts them into a nice single place, or maybe two places. Um, when you write things in the modular pattern, you end up with a ton of files. Like you might have 500 files in your application instead of three or something, because you've got, you're trying to keep things small and single purpose maybe, or you're trying to, you have all, you know, you have maybe you have 20 data models and 30 views and they have sub views and you've got some caching stuff. Uh, so you have to have some kind of system like this to put it all together. And so when you download it in production, you just have one file. Webpack does something a little differently than the sort of the first round of these was uh, require.js. Batobi makes something called Steel. They run in the browser. They pull all your files in. So you'll see 150 files coming down in your development mode. And it's a little different than production because it's pulling them all down with script tags or whatever. Um, what this does is it actually compiles constantly. So if you've ever used a Java system or a, a .NET system where you write code and it auto-recompiles and you can just go look, this does that exact same thing for JavaScript. So, which is actually nice because then you're using the same thing you're using on production. Well, pretty much. What about compiling in JavaScript? Yes, it's that's what I'm saying. It's not really compiling. So yeah, what it's fine. doing, yeah. what it's doing is evaluating, let's say these, each one of these boxes was was a, uh, a different thing. Like this is a model, this is a view, and this is, I don't know what this is, this is your index file. It, it evaluates these, it uses a parser, and it goes through them and it looks for require statements that you've defined for dependencies. It pulls all those things together in a nice dependency graph, resolves them all, concatenates the output, and creates a single file. Right, that's what the, uh, Does that make the sense? interpreter does. Yeah. 
It's, it, it's sort of, but it's like people call them compilers, you know they're not. So when you look up online and you look for stuff, you'll find like JavaScript compiler, you'll find this. It's not a compiler, really, but it, people call them that. They call them transpilers. It's kind of like the browser does, really, because the browser's an interpreter, right? So the browser's interpreting, it's pulling all these files together, sticks them all together. This just does that ahead of time, so you have one, so you have one file that you're going to use in the browser. And you need to do that for optimization, since you don't want to push hundred files over the wire when you're on your website. It's bad. You want to push this one. This is what the browser does. Okay. I'm not familiar this with this on the server. Yeah. On the server, I understand, with, with requires right. pulling it all together. Yeah, so that's what, this, this allows you to write client-side code and do the same thing. And have it all be pulled together and served to the browser as a single file. Does it optimize out libraries that are used? Yes. It does all kinds of really awesome stuff. It, this, it value, runs on the this runs on your Node-based server, so that's that's what we're going to talk about Node. So on your local system or on a build server, you run you basically run this in development mode. It does this in memory and not you know, dynamically and pushes it up, creates a single file. Um, on your in your build system, however, um, what it will do is just create this single artifact for you as part of your build process, and then you put that up in maybe a tar and you serve it on your production server. So you end up with something that's maybe three or four files for a, for a simple web application. Maybe you have a CSS artifact and a script artifact and an index HTML file. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to run this and we're going to go through this thing. Pardon uh, me? I skipped what I skipped? Grunt? Oh, Grunt. Grunt is a declarative task runner. So instead of writing shell scripts or using a make file, um, Grunt gives you a bit more common way of looking at your build process. So Grunt has a lot of tasks that you can find online that do things that you might want to do, like um, access this thing, for instance, or watch files to see if they've changed and then recompile them, or any number of other things. Um, there's a lot of very friendly Git tasks that will help you version your resources and publish things. So it's sort of a... Um, it has a lot of overlap and functionality with something like a make file, but, they, but grunt files look a lot more similar across projects um, because of the fact that the syntax is very declarative. So it's kind of one of those things where um, people that really like Spring would really love grunt because, <laughs> because it's very declarative and they don't have to write code. But unlike Spring, you can write code, which I like because I really hate having to use 8 million lines of a file when I can have like a four line function. So that really is annoying. So Grunt, because it's in Node, you can actually do anything you want. It's just that it has this these nice pre-made declarative tasks. Okay, quick question. Yes. CanJS, um, is that a commercial product or is that open source? CanJS is an open source product. Okay. Um, my company builds it as an open source project. Okay. We also build uh, a couple other things, a thing called Funk Unit and uh, Steel. Um, but we started them as open source projects, and the, the reason that we did that was because the original project was called JavaScript MVC, and it was one of the oldest okay. MVC frameworks. That was my second question. Yeah. It's an MVC or router? It's an MVC framework-ish, um, but it has some newer features. It has a web component, polyfill, and some other things like that. It's a live binding framework. It's memory safe. So it does a little more than backbone, but it isn't anywhere near as much as is Ember, for instance, um, and the API is a lot smaller. So we did that. So to use all these things that I just talked about, you need to use Node.js. Um, why do you want to use Node.js? It provides top quality tooling and cross-platform platform package for front-end development right now. It was the case a couple of years ago that you would have written stuff in Rhino, you know, in script, and maybe run it in Rhino, or maybe you would have written some Java stuff, or maybe you. To, you know, sent a binary executable down with your framework. Everybody's, everyone in the community at this point is going towards Node because you can write this in the same language for your tooling as your output. Um, and it's really fast. Um, and you can run it on the server for real if you want to. It isn't just for build. Um, and it's, there's a lot of people being very successful with Node-based production servers. Um, the thing that I really like about it the best is that you can do this. You can provide HTTP services for local development that work similarly to your production services. And you can do even more cool things than you could with just like a web service because I can write a whole bunch of cool code to fake things or do whatever. Maybe I want to recompile my 
you know, uh, compile again, <laughs> re whatever, we'll say bundle, rebundle my script um, in memory. I can do that because I have a, a node proxy basically, HTTP proxy. Once that request comes in, I can do anything I want and go and return it. And that isn't something that front end development folks have focused on as, as an option in the past. It's been very, oh, the back end gave me this, I have to do whatever kind of stuff. That isn't necessarily true anymore. And especially for development, it can be very helpful to be able to do this yourself. Um, the other thing that I think is good about it is that it reinforces some good development patterns because it requires that you use common JS modules um, to deploy your node stuff. So learn to love node. <laughs> Um, let's talk about modules for a second. Am I, is there anything that I've glossed over that I should stop at? Okay. Um, there are multiple kinds of modules in play right now. ES6, ECMAScript 6, has a standard for modules that is draft and has been draft for quite an awfully long time. It may be done this year, at the end of the year, maybe. Uh, but it isn't yet done, and the tooling for it kind of isn't there. So, um, because of that, Node uses CommonJS modules because they weren't going to wait for this. And CommonJS has a little different idea about how modules should work than the ECMAScript modules are. Um, but fundamentally, what's important is that you understand that modules, the module pattern of, of writing code is, is important and makes sense, and is, most other languages do this anyway. If you look at a Java, class, you've got import, 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 or Python, import, import, import. It's, it's, everybody's doing this, like, it's just the JavaScript wasn't really being treated as a programming language, it wasn't really being treated as a serious thing until fairly recently. Um, so, CommonJS is what Node uses, and is the, it is what you'll see if you see the word require and some something or other, that's a CommonJS module. AMD is similar to this, but it was in, sort of pointed at the browser has a little bit uglier syntax. Um, I don't particularly care for it personally, but it's better than nothing. Um, UMD is a nasty combination of these two. Um, so you usually, usually this is an output target for some kind of a transpiler or some kind of you know deal that's going to rewrite your code for you. It's going to put up UMD module format because then either interpreter for one of these can read it. And then there's this one. Now, this has some really hot, awesome features. But until the tooling is there, it's it's a little hard. We're actually we're writing our new module system to support ES6. Um, Square, the little credit card reader guys, um, have a ES6 module uh, sort of polyfill project going to right now. Um, it's worth looking at it, but it's uh, using it for production is a little frightening at the moment because it just it, the the spec is flux and it's just a little scary. So I wouldn't recommend that for production. So for production, I'd recommend Common or AMD at this point. Um, so because you have a module system, you can do dependencies in a nice declarative manifest as opposed to having to like have a HTML page of the inventory. So with Node, um, Node provides something called NPM, which is Node Package Manager. Node Package Manager evaluates a manifest file called package.json where you can declare dependencies for development or, or production if you're running a production node app. Um, so the nice thing about this is, I can just put in here all the little versions of things I want and have those things come down and I can look in one place and see every single library I'm using and what version it is. Well, that's really awesome because that just isn't the way things usually work. <laughs> usually it's like, I think I got this script tag here and I, someone checked in the library and then put the version number on it, so I hope the comment has the version in it. Um, this just makes, it, it makes you feel like you're writing real code and you're doing real stuff now with JavaScript instead of like hacking, crazy hacking. Um, the other thing this does is it lets other people use your project without having to worry about having the wrong version of stuff. Right? I can check out, you can check out my thing I've just been publishing here. You can run npm install, it'll pull all the dependencies in for you. Um, everything's in common JS modules. There's another one though called Bower. So, because um, not everybody's using Node for development, and maybe but they just want this manifest file, Bower is something that Twitter started that fundamentally just gives you a manifest file that pulls in libraries, puts them in a folder, and then you can include them in more in a more traditional way usually. 
in a script tag or whatever, but it still lets you have the manifest file. Um, for, for libraries that don't provide any kind of module system, a lot of times they'll be on the Bower uh, you know, repository, but they won't be on NPM repository. Both these things have repositories, sort of like apt would have or something. So you can type in install in the name and it will pull it in and resolve it for you. So like I said though, there are some things that are on Bower that aren't on the other one. But both systems allow you to use a git URL as a resolution target. Um, I'm going to show one really quick here. So, you can't see that. You switch to, sorry, technical community. So I've got a package JSON, which is my node package manager manifest file. Um, I've, you can declare a version, you can put a description in. There's some utilities that allow you to up version your code base. You can type NPM version major, major or minor or patch, and it'll semver, semantic version, uh, change this number here, and then it'll check in a tag automatically for you. Uh, there's just sort of like a little nice tooling that way, and it's very Git friendly. So. You can, here's my repository, here's my bug tracker, URL, all this kind of stuff. Now you can use this internally, you don't have to use it with GitHub, you can use it with any Git repo posted anywhere. So if you have a sheltered, super secure company Git repo, you can still use all these features. Um, and that's why I'm pointing out this. So in your dependency, you can use a Git URL or a node version. If you use a version here, it's going to try to hit the node package repository, which is a publicly hosted thing. Usually it works, it's probably like got a, I don't know, 90% uptime maybe. Um, this is safer if you're uh, internal and you're really concerned about the thing going down. Um, you can just use your own repo. And I actually like doing that in another way because also, because I've let this, for instance, I forked this repository. Uh, and you can put a tag on here and say what branch you want. So if you want to fix something and, you don't, and maybe they haven't accepted your pull yet, you can fork it, use this kind of thing, wait till they accept your pull, up version node, and then maybe switch back to the version if you want. You'll notice there's also a license layer, which is nice. It actually requires that you, when you do, when you want to make one of these, you type npm in it, it runs you through a process. It, for, it asks you and it really wants you to pick a license, and that's really good because it makes people think about what license they apply to their code. If there's no license on code, a lot of times you can't use it, right? Because your company says, sorry, there's no license, we can't use the code. Because I don't know what it is, it could be anything. They could come out and say it's GPL tomorrow and now I can't use it. Which, you know, is good for the people, good for some things and bad for others. Uh, here's the Bower one, it's very similar, we'll see, because they pretty much ripped it off from Node. But uh, it just, again, is these are, these are things that are not Node, these are DOM libraries, fundamentally, is what's going to be in Bower. It's stuff that modifies the DOM or manipulates the DOM, the document object model. Uh, Node does not have a DOM. So Node is a JavaScript interpreter, but it does not have a DOM, just so we're all clear. Um, there's no document object. And because of that, some things don't make sense to put in a Node repository. All right, so does that stuff all make sense? Any questions? Have I killed it? Okay, uh, let's see. Where are we? So module bundler takes all your modules and assembles them. Um, and it can run on the client or, or a server or both. So the thing I was talking about, Webpack, runs in a node process, produces an artifact that your web page uses. The other way of doing this is, like I said, push 100 files down to the client. Um, that works okay, but it, uh, and sometimes it actually is better because in certain cases the compile time or whatever we're going to call it, bundling time for Webpack might be so long that you don't 
you're just, a, you know, maybe you have 500 artifact files and it takes 10 seconds to re-bundle. Well, that's too long because I'm trying to like thrash and fix something. Every time I change the code, I have to wait 10 seconds before I can refresh the page. That's painful. Uh, although, you shouldn't be doing that anyway, <laughs> theoretically. Um, so let me just show you a Webpack configuration thing. Now the thing is, this is this is this knowledge is translatable to other bundling systems. So just because I'm showing you Webpack doesn't mean you couldn't use the same general ideas and concepts with a different bundler. So some of the things you configure are going to be very similar things you have to configure with any bundling system. Um, you have an entry point, which is in this case talking about the seed file for your application. So. This application C file is in index.js under app, and I use that convention because where common JS modules want name of folder index.js to make it the easiest to read. You can also path it completely to the script file, um, but that's why it's called index.js. What's, what's this web store in This is an IDE for JavaScript made by JetBrains. And they will give you free copies for your open source project if you have like a legit open source project. They will give you free copies of it. It's really awesome. They're super nice, like really nice. They'll give you un like unlimited licenses. Is your recommended? Uh, I like IDEs because I don't know. Um, once you learn to use this, um, then I've tried to do some Python. They have a Python one, and I sort of skipped a whole bunch of pain because I knew how to use the IDE and it helped me. Um, some people think that's cheating. I think that it's being pragmatic. Personally, <laughs> um, and it has really nice features like auto syntax validation, and it'll support your. You can check in a hint file, and everyone can have the same hint file, and the formatter actually works, and it shows you whether you're using tabs or spaces, and has the same versioning uh, interface between Subversion and Git, so you can basically do the same thing, and it does a polyfill of features for Subversion where it's missing things like stash. It has that, and it will do it for you. So. It's a visual all the other files, like your HTML files, PHP files. Yeah, it'll read any CSS. WebStorm will support any um, anything that's not PHP. They have one that does PHP that is a little, that's a different product that also does JavaScript. So it sort of goes up like that. So you have JavaScript is WebStorm. The PHP one is PHP Storm, and it does JavaScript. There's also PyCharm, which does JavaScript and Python. Then there's one for Java called IntelliJ, which you may have heard of uh, if you do Java. Um, but I've found them to be pretty solid products, and it's and it's you know eons faster than Eclipse. And this is this is made made for JavaScript and supports Node out of the box. So you've got run commands. If you've used Eclipse, you have the idea that you can run a server. You can actually hook this up and run Node with it. And it's rather useful. Um, and it also huh? and clarify. So if I want to do JavaScript and PHP and PHP HTML Storm. and CSE, PHP Storm. Is yes, that's use. right. Um, PHP Storm is really nice for PHP because PHP is a terrible mess. <laughs> uh, hey now. Yeah. <laughs> it, I don't think anyone would argue that, that PHP is not a terrible mess. Okay, so back to this file. Um, you've got an entry point. You have some resolve things. So uh, this, this particular product is nice because it allows me to declare some root module folders and say that my things are going to be resolved through these roots. So, Bower components, node modules, and app. So this is where Bower is going to pull in my things I've declared in its manifest file. This is where npm pulls in the dependencies from its manifest file. And this is where my actual application files are. These roots are used to resolve everything. So then for these libraries, I can just declare for the module what the path is. And it will stick this on for you in the front. Um, and what this allows you to do is something like this. Now, this this is something that this does that not everything does. Um, you can tell it that you want to provide certain things to your module. Now, some people really think this is a terrible idea, and other people think it's a fantastic idea. I really hate retyping the same junk every single time. If you're really proper about modules, you would always want to retype the same thing every time because the module's not truly portable if all the dependencies aren't declared in the module. But this allows you to cheat. So if you use jQuery to every single module in your application, you can just say provide it, and it will just be there all the time. You don't have to, to you don't have to say import jQuery or whatever. Same. With, so I've done that with these. Like I said, it's um, if you've got if you're if you're first learning how to use this, or it's something where you've got a team of people where varying skill sets, this might be a bad idea. But if you everyone knows what they're doing, 
and you just want to save yourself some annoying repeated stuff, this, this is helpful. Um, what else is in here? Rewriting things. Uh, it's just changing paths. So what this does is it resolves. Um, this bottom part is a loader. Uh, this is a whole nother.